Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a television program that's designed to take you through the Bible, and we look forward to doing that every day. We are in the New Testament. It is exciting. And somebody to help us do this is Corey. Corey, what's up today? Today, we are going to be taking a look at slaves and freedmen of the Roman Empire. Slaves and freedmen, excellent. Mm -hmm. Look forward to that. What did you study today? We're gonna to talk about the Greek word that is translated into brotherly love. Oh, really? That's mm -hmm. fascinating. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Also, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's going on? Today, I'm talking about the giant celestial clock. More on that later. The giant, it's not Big Ben. It's not like the Big <laughs> Ben clock. It's a, well, anyway, we'll talk about that coming up later. And today on the program, oh, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called and commanded, commanded to please God. How do you please God if you don't have faith? Well, we'll talk about that and much more later on in the program. Right now, get your Bible out and your Bible guide because we are going to study. First up today, you and I are going to be taking a look at the ancient first century city of Thessalonica. Now, this is the city to whom the Apostle Paul wrote the books of first and second Thessalonians. Now, these books weren't written as books, they were written as letters, and today we've preserved them as books. The ancient city of Thessalonica was an important seaport in the area of Macedonia. It was originally named after the sister of Alexander the Great and was at the crossroads of four major highways. In 146 BC, Macedonia was made into a Roman province and Thessalonica was established as its capital. The city gained even more prominence in 42 BC by helping Mark Antony and Octavian defeat the remaining assassins of Julius Caesar. In the first century AD, the Book of Acts records a visit to Thessalonica by the Apostle Paul. And later, Paul himself writes letters to the believers in Thessalonica that today are called the Biblical Books of First and Second Thessalonians. This first century city is estimated to have had a population around 100,000. Archaeological remains are hard to come by at Thessalonica due to the city still being actively occupied. However, a large 70 by 110 yard paved Roman style forum has been uncovered, dating from the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. Also, it is known that a 1st century Roman archway called the Vandar Arch survived in Thessalonica until 1867, when it was finally taken down. Today, an inscription from the archway survives in the British Museum. And this inscription itself helped clear up some controversy regarding the accuracy of the New Testament. In Acts 17, the author Luke mentions the city officials of Thessalonica using a previously unknown Greek term. It just so happens that the inscription from this destroyed archway also refers to the officials of Thessalonica using this exact Greek term. A little bit later on in today's program, you and I are going to discuss the issue of slavery uh, within first, the first century Roman Empire. Now, the reason I want to bring this topic up is because it really does help us to understand a little bit better the cultural context of the New Testament. So within the Roman Empire, this culture uh, is not like our Western culture of today. Uh, they value different things. It was a culture of honor and shame. You wanted to get honor and keep honor and not uh, get uh, become a shame for yourself or for your family. So the family unit was very important and uh, getting honor and keeping honor was very important. Now, one of the ways that you kept your honor was by fulfilling social obligations. Now, a social obligation to many people in uh, the first century Roman Empire would have been uh, to uh, assess 
essentially a client king, not really a client king, but those are words that it's easier for us to stand, uh, understand as Westerners because it's more modern in, in our history. But if you were a slave, you would have a master. And when you became a freed man, if you were able to buy your freedom, if your master agreed to release you for a sum of money, then you were a freed man, but you still had to daily pay your obligations socially, politically and financially to your old master. So this, uh, this hierarchy was very well established in the empire. First Thessalonians paints a remarkable picture of God's work. Now we are all sinners fallen from God's grace. But when we invite Jesus Christ into our life, we become different. We change our attitude towards sin. Sin is evil and against us and it's against our friends. We must see sin for what it is and avoid it at all cost. Now keep in mind, we are people surrounded by the sin culture. Every day and every way, we are bound by the cost of sin. With the help of Jesus Christ, we gain the victory, changing our life and situation in the best for God. Now this is wise, and we must become people who love wisdom and hate foolishness. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. You know, Janice does like an amazing job at reading the scripture for you, and this is really important. Every day, we read a passage of scripture that we're going to talk on. It's only, you know, 10 or 15 verses or whatever, but it's important that we understand what we're reading, and she does such a great job at that. Get your Bible guide out because it's time to begin this process, but if you don't have your Bible guide, why not? Send an offering in any amount to us at the U.S. address, the Canadian address, or the British address, and we'll send you a Bible guide. Or go to www.biblediscoverytv, biblediscoverytv.com, and you can get a hold of ours, uh, our Bible guide, download PDF files if you go to the donate page. And by the way, there's a TV station there that you'll want to keep an eye on because that airs all of our programs plus many other programs about the Bible. Very interesting. Now, the question is, and this is something that we need to ask ourselves in our Steps of Faith program, how do we handle ourselves? How do we handle ourselves? We need to handle ourselves wisely. 
Now that's imp- that's important. Handle yourself wisely. We read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to 6 to keep up with going through the Bible. And we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 12. Now we need to consider this scripture because Paul is talking to the church at Thessalonica and to us today. And as we read it, we'll understand why he says this. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should abound more and more, that you should abound more and more, just as you have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, for you know what commandments we give you or gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Really? Yes. Verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Very important. You should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage and uh, defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. This is amazing. Paul speaks to us, and as followers of Jesus Christ, we are commanded to please God. We must not continue in sin or in lust. This is the will of God. Now, I have people, I'm a pastor of a church, and I have people come up to me all the time and they say, well, I want to know the will of God, Pastor Rod. What's, you know, what's the will of God for my life? You know, what is it? What is it? And I usually say, well, you know, first of all, I need, to, I need to tell you, I need to read you the scripture and tell you the will of God is for us to be sanctified. And usually it's like, yeah, I know that. I know. No, 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 no. Be sanctified. Let us understand to get our life right before God. And I met somebody who I was talking to, and they said to me they were involved in uh, 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 sexual uh, exploitation and all kinds of things. And, and they said to me, well, you know, I was born that way, so I just have to live that way. I said, no, I was born that way. You were born that way. We were all born that way because we're born in sin. But when we choose God, we're born again. Words of Jesus Christ in John chapter 3, we're born again. And when we're born again, we recognize that Jesus Christ can change us and can make us better and make us right. Very important. We go on to verse 7. It says, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man. No, he doesn't. But he rejects God who has also given us for his Holy Spirit. you got to be kidding me. The truth is we are not called to uncleanness. We are not called to lust, but we are called to victory. God has given us his promise. The Father's promise is the Holy Spirit in our life. Some people say to me, well, I can't, I've tried, I can't. It's because... You don't really know the Holy Spirit. (laughs) You need to seek God and seek Jesus Christ and ask him for the Holy Spirit. Once you've repented and said no to sin, you need to say, Lord, I'm going to be involved in this again unless the Holy Spirit comes in and changes me. And you know, God will do that. He will change the way you think. He will change the way you do things. If you allow the Holy Spirit to change you, very, very important. Look at chapter or chapter 4, verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves have, are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business to mind your own business, Twitter and Facebook, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. Now, this is really important. We are to mind our own business 
and work with our hands, walking uprightly for those who are outside to see. See, beloved, this is the important thing. Right now we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have LinkedIn, we have all these other networks. And I want to tell you something. People ask me, how come you won't talk to me? Well, because I limit myself. Because I know that it's really easy to get involved in criticizing a politician or criticizing that person or this person. We need to keep ourselves focused on God. And we should use these things only to encourage and to help people. We, we don't need to be broadcasting. We don't need to be talking. We don't need to be uh, Facebooking or, or about our life or about uh, you know, the negative things that happen to us. We need to encourage one another. The Bible tells older women to tell younger women to teach them how to love their husband. Older men to be reverent. Very, very important. So let us be reverent today in all of our messaging. The Apostle Paul had to deal with many diverse issues within the early church, and one of those issues revolved around slavery. What do you do when you have both masters and slaves of masters in the Christian church? Slavery was an accepted way of life in the first century empire of Rome. It was integrated into the very economic and social fabric of life. In fact, during the first century AD, it has been estimated that one out of every five residents of Rome was a slave. Enslavement of an individual could be due to conviction of a crime, being caught as a prisoner of war, birth to a slave mother, being sold as a child, or the selling of oneself to pay off debt. Due to these varying conditions of slavery, to be enslaved did not always mean to remain a slave. There was an upward ladder for those who were not convicted criminals. Slaves of the convict sort ended up being sent for hard physical labor that significantly shortened their lifespan. The average household slave, however, did experience a type of accepted path to freedom. Slaves were given a sort of wage that, if desired, could be saved up to purchase their freedom. These freedmen still had legal obligations to their old masters, but they could reach great standing within the empire. It was also common for slaves to purchase their freedom by sacral manumission, that is, using the symbolic legal standing of a god or goddess through the priests of the temple to purchase their freedom with the saved up wages. In the later empire, the Christian church is known to have acted in this function. Regardless of this ability to purchase freedom, slaves were at the mercy of their owners. They had no legal human rights. Greek and Roman thinkers define slaves in this way. The slave is a living tool and the tool a lifeless slave. Slaves are seen as articulate instruments to be used for the furtherance of the Roman Empire. Full of imagery, rich symbolism, and powerful theology, the New Testament book of Revelation provides its reader with much to think about. For over a year, Doctor of Theology and Pastor Rod Hembry has been studying and teaching through each chapter of Revelation. This month, we are pleased to offer this completed teaching commentary set. Each set contains six DVDs and over 11 hours of teaching covering each chapter of Revelation. This set is available at a suggested donation of $150. If you would like to order yours, please write, call, or go online today and ask for Revelation World of the Future. What does the New Testament really say about Christmas? And where did our nativity traditions come from? If you want to discover the history of Christmas, I encourage you to get a hold of our latest Discover the World of the Bible episode and study along with me, Corey Babechko, as I dig into Christmas past.
Thanks for staying with us as we continue to go through the Bible in one year. It is very exciting. We are approaching Revelation. I'm very excited about that. But uh, it is important you know that next time on the Quick Study television program, the love of God is truly like a family. And we're, when we go to church, it's like going to a family outing. It's mm -hmm. excellent. We'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, here's Ryan. Did you know that the sun, moon, and stars are excellent timekeepers? Well, to Bible believers, this is no surprise since this was one of their purposes as set forth by God in Genesis chapter 1. But how do we harness these lights of the heavens? Let's study. According to Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, God created the lights of the heavens to divide the day from the night, to give light on the earth, and to be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. And this is exactly what they function as. Consider the lesser light. The moon takes 29 and one half days to orbit the earth. This in fact is what our month is based upon, and even the word month is derived from moon. During the moon's orbit around Earth, it goes through four cycles or lunar phases. Each phase has a different appearance and is visible for about one week. The different appearances are a result of the position of the moon's orbit in relation to where the sun and the Earth are. The moon's first phase is called new moon and is invisible to us. This is because during this phase, the moon is directly between the Earth and sun. Therefore, we are viewing the dark side of the moon against the equally dark night sky. After one week, the moon is in its second phase, known as the first quarter moon, or half moon. By week three, the moon is in its third phase, called full moon. In contrast to the new moon phase, the full moon phase is when the moon is on the side of the earth opposite the sun. This is the brightest of all the other phases, and it is during this phase that a lunar eclipse can occur. This happens when the Earth passes between the Sun and Moon. The Earth casts its shadow onto the Moon, and the Earth's atmosphere bends the sunlight, giving the Moon a reddish glow. On the fourth week, the Moon is in its final phase, called the last quarter Moon, and it has the same half-moon appearance as Phase 2. The Moon then returns to the first phase to begin its cycle once again. The orbit of the Moon is like clockwork. It is never late and never early. Further, due to the ease of viewing the lunar phases, the lunar calendar is fairly popular. Indeed, not only was it the calendar the Hebrews used in the Bible, but it is also used by the Arab nations and is still the official calendar of Israel. The moon, therefore, an important timekeeper, is a testimony to the ancient and inspired words of Genesis chapter 1. It really shouldn't surprise us that the moon is so accurate in its timekeeping. This is what we would expect from a genius creator. Now, that being said, those who don't believe in a creator, well, they have some explaining to do. Well, next Friday, we're going to continue on this time train as we take a look at the greater light, the sun, and of course, the stars also. Fascinating. Excellent work, Ryan. We'll look mm -hmm. forward to that next time on Quick Study Television. Yes. Now, um, you did some study today mm -hmm. on our topic and on our uh, scripture. What mm -hmm. did you do? Well, we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I was taking a look at verses 9 through 12, which really deal with brotherly love and an orderly life. And Paul is giving instructions to the church in Thessalonia, the, the Thessalonian church. And so the Greek word for brotherly love is actually Philadelphia. And this seems to govern the content of the verses that I mentioned, 9 through 12, uh, to encourage fellow Christians to do the following. Lead a quiet life, mind one's own business, and also to work with one's hands. Now, here's what can happen if we don't follow those things. We can, it, it can place a burden of dependence on the community of faith and give a poor testimony to outsiders if we don't lead a quiet life, mind our own business, and work, not work, with our own hands. And Paul himself demonstrated, Rod, uh, his worth e ethic um, by providing for his own needs. We know that Paul was a tent maker. And uh, he spoke about that and also in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 9, For you remember our labor and hardship, brothers, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preached God's gospel to you. 
Yeah, that's true. Uh, one of the things that Paul was concerned about was people would think that he's coming through and they're using the gospel to make money. Right. And that was a big concern at that time. This was the first time that the gospel had really uh, introduced itself through mm -hmm. Jesus Christ coming, dying on the mm -hmm. cross and raising again and so on. Mm -hmm. And remember that Paul also was the one who was against this and uh, originally when he was Saul. That's right. And he was converted. So he sees all of this laid out and mm -hmm. God has done a remarkable work through Paul the Apostle's life, just unbelievable work. Yeah. And you know, you look at the 13 books of the New Testament and it's amazing. But this is, this is what Paul was concerned about. He did not want the people to see that this was a prosperity doctrine or a doctrine to get you rich, but it was a doctrine of reality, of God, of Jesus Christ coming on earth, dying on the cross for our sins, and then raising from the dead miraculously. Mm -hmm. And no one could do that except himself. And then of course, it's, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you invite Jesus Christ as Lord in your life and he changes every single thing. Today, the Christian life is considered one of confusion and varying options. For those who are truly sold out to God through Jesus Christ, the Christian life is not confusing at all. It is best described in Thessalonians. We must work very hard to stay away from sin. We must not try to justify our personal weaknesses with the world's view of Jesus Christ. The Bible is clear about that. We must know and understand what the Bible actually says about the life of one who wholeheartedly follows Jesus Christ. If there is no change in us because we love the Lord, then we really do not follow Him. The Lord is good and God loves us so much that He sent His only begotten Son, whose name is Jesus Christ, he is the Lord. He's not a swear word. It's true. He is the Lord. 2,000 years ago and he died on the cross, we killed him. But then miraculously he rose from the dead on his own. Why did he do that? So that we could call on him today and pray to him and say, Lord, come into my life. Be the Lord of who I am and give me eternal life. God will do it if we call on him. <music> 